All right, I think we're all set to get started. Um, thanks everyone for taking time out of your busy schedules to join us today. My name's Mickey, I'm here from Coalition based in Ontario and uh, look forward to today's presentation. Um, just getting some messages in chat here um, that the audio is echoing. So hopefully it sounds okay for everybody else. But I'll continue if there's issues, I'll try to connect with a different headset. Um, the goal of today's presentation is to tell you more about Coalition. Um, we've got a, a great lineup of colleagues um, joining today who I'll introduce very shortly. And we'll be excited to tell you more about what makes Coalition unique, um, how we're driving success with our broker partners, and why you should consider working with us. Um, we've got some brokers who uh, are you know, interested, have reached out to us and are learning, uh, interested in learning more about Coalition. So uh, we're gonna go ahead and get things started. Very quick introductions, and my colleagues will introduce themselves as well. We've got Katie Pollock joining based in Toronto. She's on our business development team. Denton Barnes also on our business development team based in Winnipeg, supporting our brokers in Central Canada. We have Shelly Ma based in Toronto, working with our policyholders across North America on incident response. And myself, Mickey Ho, I've been with the company for just over a year, um, almost a year and a half since we launched in Canada back in May of last year. Uh, we're all probably very familiar with Zoom at this point, um, having spent a lot of time on it over the past year, but just wanted to highlight a couple of things here. We do have a chat function. If you wanna chat directly with the panelists, please feel free to use chat. And we also have Q&A up and running. Uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to, to type them in. We will also share our contact information at the end so you can follow up. Um, but we will try to answer questions throughout and we'll have some time at the end of the presentation as well. Um, to answer those questions for all attendees. Very quickly on the table of contents, what we'll chat about today, um, Coalition's story. Coalition is extremely unique in the way that we offer insurance and risk management solutions. So we'll tell you more about that. We've got our key differentiators, which Danton will chat through. Claims when it comes to cyber is extremely important. So we're excited to have Shelly here to talk more about claims as well as our approach to incident response. So we've got an action packed agenda Again, please feel free to answer, uh, ask questions throughout and we'll be happy to answer them. Uh, there was one question that came in through chat about a recording of the webinar. We will share that following the webinar with attendees. So, uh, you know, definitely take some notes if you're interested, but we will also share a recording that we're happy for you to, to review again. Very quickly before I hand off to Katie, just wanted to introduce the coalition team. Uh, we do have colleagues across the country working on our engineering uh, back-end threat intelligence teams, but we have a team of insurance professionals as well. So um, George and myself uh, kicked things off in Canada uh, May of last year, and we've grown significantly since then. We have two underwriters focused on our business in Canada, two incident response professionals, and then we've got a team of business development individuals who work with our brokers across the country, supporting you, helping you write business coalition, answering questions about cyber, Think of us as you, your go-tos um, as you start working with Coalition. So I'm going to hand it off to Katie here. Um, again, thanks everyone for joining. Uh, really excited to be here today. And um, please ask questions if there's anything that comes up throughout the presentation. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. I'm Katie Pollack. I joined Coalition this year, and I have almost 10 years of experience in the insurance industry. Most recently at Berkeley, where I underwrote tech ENO, including cyber and a few other lines of business. So Coalition is at the forefront of cyber insurance and technology and really doing it in a unique way. So our story is very different than the usual MGA. We weren't founded by a few insurance professionals who wanted to go out and do their own thing. We were founded by two entrepreneurs, Sada and John Herring, both of whom have extensive backgrounds in cybersecurity and technology. John Herring, being a silent partner, was the first person to successfully hack into Tesla. And then Josh Mata, who's also our CEO, has an incredible professional background. He sold his first company to Microsoft at the age of 14, where he became their youngest employee. And he was recruited out of high school to join the CIA as one of their first members of the cyber warfare unit post 9-11 and then most recently spent some time at Cloudflare. So as you can see, this puts a very unique fingerprint on Coalition. He was able to see firsthand how companies were being targeted by adversaries and how from an insurance perspective, 
no solution was really being offered to actually mitigate cyber risk. Everything was sort of being offered on a reactive rather than a proactive basis, which is where the idea for coalition stemmed from. So Josh and John agreed that cybersecurity was too expensive and complex, making it inaccessible to all but the largest corporations. So they set out to create a solution that would combine an insurance product with a variety of tools and services that would help mitigate an insured cyber risk. And their mission was to solve cyber risk. Next slide, slide please, Mickey. So we were founded in 2017 in San Francisco and wrote our first policy in January of 2018. Um, we just celebrated our fourth anniversary and first in Canada. So we're one of the fastest growing cyber, uh, cyber companies in the world. We're now top 10. And in just four short years, we have over 18,000 policyholders and over 200 employees across the company, all dedicated towards our mission of solving cyber risk. So one year ago, when we first launched in Canada, we had only two Canadian employees on the insurance side and no brokerages. And then if you fast forward to today, we now have 10 employees on the insurance and incident response team in Canada. And we've already written 7.2 million in GWP to date, and we're growing more and more every month. So there's really no slowing down for us. As you can see from the other slide that Mickey shared, we have the largest cyber insurance team in Canada right now. So we run about 48 trillion scans annually, and we have a ton of veterans at the company with a ton of experience that they're bringing to the table. And we just closed our series D funding with $300 million, all dedicated towards tackling cyber risk. So we are an MGA. We're backed by Swiss Re and Archery in Canada, both A plus rated carriers. So 70% Swiss Re and 30% Archery, both of whom I'm sure you're very familiar with, Swiss Re being one of the largest reinsurers on the globe. So what they've both decided is that they don't want to focus on the small tech and cyberspace. And they think that our solution is very different in the way that we underwrite and the solutions that we provide to our brokers. So both of them decided to support us in our journey to solve cyber risk. It is very important to point out that we have a three-year deal with both of them. So we aren't your typical MGA that would require updated contracts annually. We write primary cyber and tech you know, um, with excess capabilities coming very shortly. We can consider up to billion in revenue with 20 million in limits. Um, we also have a very broad appetite. It's much easier for me to tell you about the classes that we don't write, which would be payment processors, payment enablers, data aggregators, casinos, adult entertainment, managed service providers, and cannabis. Um, we're actually actively working on a solution for cannabis as well in Canada. So we would love to try and partner with you on anything else that you might have on your desk. Next slide, please, Mickey. So this is our feedback loop. At our core, we are a tech company with a focus on data aggregation. So we believe that by using existing data, technology, and the technical expertise of our team, we can make, make better, more informed decisions when it comes to underwriting. So this feedback loop allows us to offer broader coverage at a more competitive price and actually maintain that over the long term. So the, the market's underwater at the moment. The number of ransomware and funds transfer cases has skyrocketed in the last 18 months or so. And with that, there are current, currently corrections being made in the marketplace. There are a lot of carriers looking to take substantial rate, often combining that with co-insurance provisions, decrease in limits, or even getting off risk entirely. But I just want to be clear that that is not the approach we're taking at Coalition, and it really is because of this feedback loop. By collecting more data, we're able to make better, more informed decisions in real time and it gives us a real advantage over our competition and allows us to be a stable alternative in the marketplace. Uh, next slide, please, Nikki. So this is our value chain. Um, as mentioned, we have a variety of differentiators in the marketplace. Coalition is looking to take a, a different approach um, to how we partner with our in insureds. We're not just offering a financial product, we're combining our insurance offerings with a variety of tools and services to help them mitigate their overall cyber risk. 
So first we have our quoting platform. So we offer sort of a frictionless quoting uh, process. We only ask about eight questions. We don't ask questions like, have you updated your systems or do you have a firewall in place? And not because we don't care, it's because we can actually see that. We can see, yes, you have a firewall. We can even tell you if it's updated, what version it is. So you can rate, quote, and bind a policy in about four minutes on our platform. Um, so it's a really convenient tool to access coalition. We would still su uh, accept submissions manually, but this is the quickest way to access us is through our quoting platform. Um, next, you would have our products. So our policy offers some of the broadest coverage in the marketplace. Uh, Danton will go over some of the specific differentiators in a minute, but that's really driven by the amount of data that we collect and our ability to make underwriting decisions, which has an impact on our entire portfolio business and allows us to offer that broad coverage. Next is our underwriting process. So how we underwrite is a big def differentiator. So we're using technology to collect data, which allows us to get a, picture, a better picture of what our um, insured cyber footprint looks like. So using a, a paper application is a way of the past. It really is an efficient way to underwrite a risk anymore, and it doesn't truly capture a, com or capture a, a company's exposure. Uh, certainly not the way our process and scan uh, does. And then we have our risk management tools. Uh, we offer a variety of tools to our policyholders, whether that's the proactive monitoring that we do throughout the policy period or the variety of third party applications that we have, which are all designed to proactively improve the cyber posture of our insureds. And then finally, our claims and incident response team. We have internal teams within coalition with a ton of experience that, that's at the disposal of our insureds when they have a breach. So it allows us to proactively manage the uh, claims process in a way that mitigates the overall size of a claim and helps to get our insureds on their feet faster and overall provides them with a better claims experience. So now I'm gonna pass it over to Danton where he'll talk more about the technology differentiators and quoting process. Katie, before we hand over to Danton, we had a question on coverage and we all know that there's still a lot of differences in the language that's used across different competitors and the policies. Uh, Paul asked a question about the differences between ransom, extortion, and funds transfer. And I think Shelley will touch a little bit on some of the claims that we're seeing, but would you sort of be able to just quickly touch on those three things between ransom, extortion, and funds transfer? Um, sure, I can try and touch on that quickly. So cyber extortion is basically when a bad actor gets into the system and encrypts all of the data so that the insured has no access to their system. And sometimes they would also be able to encrypt their backups if they're not completely separate from their system. And then funds transfer fraud, sort of like social engineering, it's tricking the insured into sending money to a bad actor. Um, Shelly's going to go into specific claims details in a minute. Um, Great. Yeah. Thanks, Katie. We'll okay. hand it off to Danton now. Uh, thanks, Katie. Thanks, Mickey. Um, as introduced, I'm Danton Barnes. I've been in the insurance industry for just over nine years, uh, spending time on the commercial underwriting side, as well as business developments in Manitoba, Saskatchewan, and Northwest Ontario. So technology is a really exciting topic when we deliver the coalition message. The industry is always looking for better ways to underwrite, especially for cyber. The way technology is just so intertwined throughout all of coalition's operations, especially in underwriting, claims, and risk management tools, which we provide our policyholders, it really illustrates how we are at the forefront of cyber insurance and security in today's market. Our signals intelligence platform represents a more sustainable way to underwrite and price risk. We underwrite to risk and price of what we see through our technology scans. The way we do this is we look through the eyes of a bad actor or adversary, but we don't actually go into a network. We just scan the perimeter of that network. Like how a possible intruder would scan the perimeter of a building, look for security cameras, fences, uh, possible entryways through doors and windows. We take a walk around the perimeter of a network looking for IPs, firewalls, any possible ports of entry, all items that are publicly facing in which we can see and detect. Uh, next slide, Mickey. 
So the signal intelligence platform is critical across our entire company. What this looks like from a broker's perspective is, it's really a quick and easy way to get a cyber quote in a few minutes with limited information. Where we lack some questions on our platform or application compared to the traditional cyber applications, we pick them, we pick them up through our security scan. That's that perimeter walk around the network. It's also being able to bind a quote in seconds and also send our signature bundle to the client or prospect for them to sign off on and send back to us to issue the policy. All of this illustrates just a streamlined way to help quote cyber. We have a risk management platform where we use our signals intelligence to provide clients with tools to actively help manage their risk. We see around 90% and above actively log on our platform and get insight into their business. This shows real value being provided on top of your standard cyber insurance policy. The cost can be upwards of thousands per month if a client uses these security tools outside of coalition. We proactively scan our insurance networks to see if there are any new vulnerabilities throughout the policy term. We also scan the news for new vulnerabilities, and then we will scan to see if those vulnerabilities exist for our policyholders and help them mitigate the risk the second or minute we know about it. Now, a good example of this in action is the more recent Microsoft Exchange on-premises vulnerability, where we help some of our policyholders patch their network to prevent the vulnerability from causing a claim. These vulnerabilities could lead to claims such as ransomware, social engineering fraud, and the like. These are events where insurance policies would cover and pay out, but if we're able to identify and mitigate before a potential breach or threat occurs, we can almost prevent, or at the very least, lessen the impact as well as patch or assist in improving our policyholders' networks for the future. A common saying you'll hear from us here at Coalition is that we want to provide a holistic approach to cyber insurance, and actually is part of the strategic vision of our founders. And Singles Intelligence really helps us drive that holistic approach of the system before, during, and after a claim, threat, or vulnerability is spotted via our security scanner tools. Next slide. So this is how our data works for quoting and also is the foundation of the feedback loop Katie touched on earlier. All the data we collect helps us analyze risk to quotes, manage risk and manage claims. We can correlate all this info we have to risk. We understand what a company's cyber footprint is. We understand what third party services are being used. And we can also look at our aggregate exposure across the book of business very easily because of how we underwrite. This all leads to the following outcomes. We either provide a quote, quote with a contingency, or in some cases decline, although we do try to do all we can to ensure a risk and help mitigate where needed. We provide a risk assessment that outlines a company's cyber exposure at no charge. We have continuous network scanning, as previously mentioned, to proactively identify and alert policyholders of potential threats to their network and or systems. And we also have some partnerships with some companies such as Malwarebytes and TwinGates, leading IT security companies, which allow us to better protect our insureds. Next slide. As we touched on earlier, we don't require those lengthy applications to underwrite, quote, and bind. We do have an application you can use. However, it's only one page and it's extended to two if you're needing tech e &O cover. Currently, you can rate, quote, and bind in minutes on our platform. We're always working on and improving our APIs across the company. And really the goal here is to be able to have an API so a quote can be done in just milliseconds. To get a quote started on the platform, we only need five points of information. We need name, website domain, industry, revenue, and address. Our signals intelligence takes care of the rest and is non-invasive. The perimeter network scan for publicly available information. Using domain, we can see publicly facing IP addresses as well as all services they use. We scan tens of thousands of data points in seconds and we can correlate it directly to risk. As Katie mentioned earlier too, for example, we don't need to ask questions about the firewall. We can pick up all this information on the scan, including web version, the latest patch and other information. 98% of our broker interaction actually happens online. We have a chat feature on the platform and our website that connects directly to our customer success team. You can ask virtually any question related to a policy, coverage, claims, and you can even facilitate buying orders through here. Overall, this represents a quicker, easier way to interact with the insurance company and helps remove some friction throughout the entire process. 
Next slide. We're proud to say we have some of the broadest coverage in the cyber marketplace currently. We won't dive too deep in depth into the individual coverages, but we did want to highlight a few here that we have. So we can offer up to 500,000 in funds transfer fraud and social engineering coverage for our policyholders. It is underwritten on a case-by-case -case basis, but we are able to go up to that limit. Our breach response costs occur outside the limits. So this would include ongoing legal and forensic services, notification of regulators and affected individuals, and credit monitoring and identity restoration services for affected individuals. We also provide bodily injury and property damage third-party coverage relating to cyber incidents, as well as pollution coverage. Next slide. On every quote, we provide a risk assessment outlining a company's cyber exposure and no charge from coalition. That's something that could cost about $2,500 to $3,000 if you went to an outside party for a similar report. This report can be downloaded on demand throughout the policy term. We also have a risk management platform available for all of our policyholders. This is a snapshot of the company's risk at a moment in time. Through this, we can provide actionable insight into risk, many of which can be implemented at no cost or with minimal investment. These insights are directly tied to risks that we know adversaries are looking to exploit. A common trend we see is a policyholder taking that risk assessment we provided to their IT team or IT provider, them actively working on mitigating the items that were found through our scan, implementing those changes, and then watching on the platform their risk score improve. One thing to keep in mind here is that we are a cyber technology company and we have a team of security professionals that can actually help our policyholders implement those changes we indicate on the platform and risk assessments as high risk, medium risk, or low risk and walk them through the steps to do so. Once again, we scan throughout the policy term, not just on new business, not just on renewal. If we find a critical vulnerability or issue on our insurance network, we actually alert them via email and we also alert the brokers we are reaching out to the insured, all in effort to help mitigate the risk before a loss occurs. Next slide. Danton, before we move on to the next slide, we had a great question from Pauline. Um, she asked if a client only uses a social media page um, as opposed to a website address, can we use that in the quoting platform? So um, I'll sort of add some context there. If somebody uses Facebook, for example, to advertise their business, what would we do from a quoting standpoint? Great question, Pauline. So in that case, you know, we wouldn't need the domain because they're using um, Facebook or social media. We're looking for those unique domains. So in situations where they may just use a Facebook as their website, um, maybe their email might be, uh, say it's a financial company. Um, they may be, just use a Facebook page for whatever reason. And um, they're, but they have a unique email domain. So say one, two, three financial. Uh, we would need that, e we would use that email domain as a unique domain. You know, if they just use Gmail as well for email, then we wouldn't need to, uh, you wouldn't need to supply any domain and we would have to um, review that um, kind of separately from entering the domain. So we actually own an in-house incidents response team who really understands cyber risk in a different way. This team is unique as we employ CIA and NSA expertise to assist with claims. As you can see in this graphic, we are actually able to identify what are known as red spiders that could lead to an attack or event in an insurance network. One thing to remember here is that the team helps pre-breach and also post-breach using the data we collected on underwriting. As the slide states here, 45% of pre-breach events are resolved at no cost to our insureds. And another stat we're really proud of and sets us apart from the market is 84% of stolen funds are recovered by our team following funds transfer fraud claims. If we recover the stolen funds, it helps lessen the impact on claims and helps lower our loss ratio, which effectively helps keep our premiums down. This all ties right back into that feedback loop. We do have Shelly speaking in a moment here, so I won't spoil anything more, but this is just a quick highlight of how successful the team has been and is always improving. Uh, next slide. So here, uh, this slide details the feedback we've received and tracked via NPS or Net Promoter Score, which is standard across the industry. 
A typical or average NPS is about 35 for a policyholder and broker. And as you can see here, we actually receive quite higher NPS based on our services. We see 69% or 69 NPS from our policy hold, from our insureds and 90 NPS from our broker partners. This is kind of unheard of when you think of insurance having scores this high, well above the average. Um, just wanna highlight some of the individual feedback here. Uh, one broker said, we have the most innovative solutions, which was definitely refreshing to hear as that's part of the mission we strive for at Coalition. One policyholder was instantly impressed with their services just after purchasing a policy from us. Following a claim, another policyholder was gobsmacked, as they put it, in how fast we were able to deploy our team and recover money on their behalf. I'm just gonna read the third one in full here because it really highlights a great point. Um, this is from a broker. Responses are always fast, quotes are even faster. Coverages and risk management services are great and innovative. You've done many things that improve the cyber market as a whole, and I think it will spread to other lines as well. So uh, right here, I'll pass it off to Shelly to touch on claims to CIR. Always appreciate the overview, Denton. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Shelly Ma. I'm an incident response lead at Coalition based in Toronto. Uh, it's finally warming up here, so I'm in a good mood. It's a pleasure to be here today. I'm certainly looking forward to diving into um, coalition offerings with you and paint a broader picture on the types of claims that we're seeing hitting our cyber landscape these days and what we can do to mitigate and respond to these incidents. All right, Mickey, let's go to the next slide. So of course, and very unsurprising, the most severe type of claim that we're seeing these days is ransomware. I'm pretty sure that at this stage of the game, ransomware doesn't need too much of an introduction, given how often it pops up in the, in the media. So as a quick recap, ransomware is a type of malware that is designed to encrypt digital files or disks, making them completely inaccessible to the user. The encryption by the ransomware is supposed to be reversible, typically by way of contacting the attacker, paying a ransom, and then acquiring the, the uh, decryption key. The goal of a ransomware actor is to render the entirety of a network or at least a significant portion of it completely inoperable so that it can greatly disrupt business. Um, and the reason why it's so widespread among cyber criminals is because ransomware offers this immediate monetization of the cyber event, right? So the attack happens, the victim pays a ransom and immediately you get, you get a profit. And because of the immediate monetization, it has proven worthwhile to bad actors that they have produced this novel approach to ransomware. And these novel approaches um, branched off from the prior experiences with ransomware. Some now take proof of data exfiltration with them as well and hold this to show you, the company, that they have valuable information so that ultimately they can strong arm you into paying the ransom uh, at the risk that they'll disclose that information on the internet. And these novel forms of attacks are becoming increasingly expensive. From 2019 to 2020, you'll see that we saw a 153% increase in the severity of ransomware attacks, which we believe you know, partly was an impact of COVID. And this is likely due to the change in security and structure, and it all being very tested due to the remote working situation. So as a measure of comparison, I always like to provide some background information on the evolution of ransoms as I've encountered them. I first started responding to ransomware in early 2016. And at that time, ransomware was still quite nascent. It was still really new. The very first ransom I paid was just one Bitcoin and that was about 300 US dollars. And at the time, we had no idea how to even purchase Bitcoins. So we found this random dealer on an exchange site who only accepted cash. And we had to put the bills in a brown paper bag and met up with this guy on the street corners of downtown San Francisco. And after he finished counting the bills in the streets, he transferred the Bitcoins to us via his iPad. So it was super dodgy. I still get goosebumps thinking about that time. But thankfully, since then, purchasing cryptocurrency has become a lot more conventional, but so has ransomware. And the largest ransom that I had handled by 2017 was $50,000. By 2018, it escalated to $300,000. And now it's not entirely uncommon to see ransoms in the millions. Um, the largest ransom that I've personally dealt with to date was $10 million. Um, however, I have seen ransoms surpassing $40 million. So they are very expensive. Next slide. 
funds transfer fraud, FTF, like ransomware, is an immediate monetization of the crime. And we see that from last year, there has been a 39% increase in the frequency of FTF, an increase from a previous year that also saw an increase from the year before that. So in a moment, I'll discuss how coalition handles FTF matters and what sets us apart from other carriers. Next slide. But just before I do that, let's quickly touch on business email compromises. With BECs, 60% of the time, the attack vector or the entry point was email. It makes sense in an email-driven climate that this would be the case. When you layer this with COVID, we have seen a 67% increase in business email compromises because email, at the end of the day, it is the main form of communication and because brick and mortar systems have gone online. What was interesting is that those entities that use Microsoft 365 were three times more likely to have experienced a business email compromise than any other service. So we get asked a lot why this is the case. Mostly when an entity starts with a Microsoft product, they start with zero security measures. And then it is up to the user of the product to build on that security. So it is not that Microsoft is inherently unsafe. It is that there are just so many ways to fine tune the product and many don't have the proper security measures in place. Also, if you think about it, Office 365 is hugely popular with over 200 million users compared to G Suite that has only 6 million users. So because of its popularity, attacker spends a lot of time and energy cultivating attack methodologies to target Office 365 specifically. I hope that I was able to address the earlier question about the differences between extortion and FTF. It's, a, it's an excellent question. And this is exactly what the similarities and differences are. Ransom is just a payment. Extortion and ransom includes the ransomware as well as the payment. And FTF has no element of taking the data message, just willingly the client parting with money as a result of being manipulated into doing so. Next slide. Now, looking at the market frequency, which is the number that the general insurance market is seeing for claim frequency, the number of claims that are made by insureds around the globe. As you'll note, the market was at 4.75% in 2018 and 6.2% in 2019. 2020 is yet to be determined. And this year over year increase is 32% in claims in the market from 2018 to 2019. What is thought to be, um, well, we, we assume that this is probably due to the continued adoption of technology and with companies now um, having this infrastructure set up where the criminals can very easily gain access as well as execute cyber crimes. But what is worth noting is that coalition policyholders reported 1.3% and 1.5% claim frequencies, which is far lower than the market average. And this translates to less than a quarter the frequency of claims than what the rest of the market experience. So we at coalition hold that this is due in no small part to our differentiated, differentiated approach to underwriting and risk management. Next slide. As I mentioned, from 2018, I'm sorry, from 2019 to 2020, there was a 39% increase in the frequency of FTFs. But unlike that of ransomware and the payment of ransoms via cryptocurrency, there is a way to recover FTF funds and that is an immediate outcome. In fact, in working promptly and efficiently with the insurance coalition has been able to successfully recover 55% of funds transfers fraudulently um, transferred to bad actors. And we call this a clawback. And amongst those that have, we've been able to successfully claw back, we've recovered 85% of the lost funds. This statistic looked even better in 2020 where we were able to recover 94% of the funds. We do this with banking relationships, structure within organizations um, and coalition and working with law enforcement. And this is all valuable to our insurers. Next slide. So the largest clawback to date was actually one where we responded to an FTF for a Canadian insured. Um, so on April 9th, a member of our claims team received an alert from an insured that had accidentally wired $5 million to the wrong account. Basically, it was one of their suppliers whom they pay monthly to. Two weeks after the original invoice came in March, the insured received an email from the supplier notifying them that the banking information was updated. And I say updated in quotation marks, but this was actually a spoofed fraudulent email. The insured then inadvertently wired the money on April 9th to the bad actor 
and notified the legitimate supplier by phone that this was done and told them to expect an incoming payment. But two hours later, the supplier, who did not receive the money, of course, called up our insured, letting them know that they still haven't received the funds. After checking the transaction information with the supplier, the insured came to that horrifying, earth-shattering realization that they transferred the $5 million to the wrong account. So the insured immediately called their broker who put them in touch with coalition. Um, and this was around 9 p.m. Pacific time on that same day. A stroke of luck in this case was, was that our insured's bank was RBC and the fraudulent bank was TD Bank. Um, likely the threat actor would have pulled the funds out of the TD account into an international location as soon as a hit. And once funds go international, we would have to then contend with issues of law enforcement jurisdiction, time zone issues, sovereignty issues, interbanking policies and the complexities of that. And we know that attackers move very quickly. So we had to move quickly as well to claw back those funds before they went overseas. Um, and we were able to successfully do so. You know, there was a lot of like frustrated conversations and hounding of banks, uh, but this is a success story. And so of course we were able to streamline the process in working with both banks and having knowledge of interbanking agreements. We ordered the accounts to be frozen and filed a report with the anti-fraud uh, center and the police. By the 12th of that month, we were able to recover the funds in full. So this is a really big success story. Next slide. I wanted to quickly run through the claims notification process. When an insured experiences a cyber event that triggers our policy, it's something that we want to know right away. They can call our emergency hotline or chat on intercom through our site or submit notice via email. It doesn't have to be formal. It can even be a chat that says, hey, I'm having issues and nothing more. We can then actively find the person that reached out, like go to the policy holder dashboard um, or find contact information and be on the phone in minutes. We don't sit, we move um, so we can do damage control as soon as possible. We had a ransomware matter last week where the broker called in but had no contact information for the insured and they didn't enter it on the dashboard and the insured's website was completely down. We then scoured the internet and found the contact number on a Facebook business profile and they made the call. So the claims team is a policyholder's first contact with coalition, impressions and speed count, especially when there is, um, when it's a time of crisis and there's urgency for a policyholder and claims takes pride in our active involvement. Next slide. And best for last, yes, I am biased. I'm going to spend the lot next few slides just introducing you to Coalition uh, Instant Response, which is a very unique offering by Coalition to its policyholders. Where my team steps in is when that fraudulent wire transfer has already been made or that ransomware has already gone rampant and it's time to call in the paramedics. So this is a typical incident timeline, starting with the discovery of the suspected cyber incident. For example, you boot up, on your, you boot up your computer at the start of the workday and you notice that everything is encrypted. You can't open any applications, email's not working, and there's this ransom demand on your screen for a million dollars. Or you get called by your employees claiming that they didn't receive their payroll to their newly changed bank accounts. These types of scenarios are just far too common. The IR team will then get on the phone with you and conduct an assessment on whether forensic investigation needs to be kicked off. If so, we'll work with your IT team to remediate the situation and mitigate the security risk or stop the bleeding. Um, then we would perform a forensic examination on the impacted systems to reconstruct the activities of the attacker and specifically to figure out whether there was any exposure of data. And of course, coalition would cover the expenses of the remedial efforts, including forensics and breach counsel. Investigations usually include the retention of an attorney who quarterbacks the process and provides legal direction, ensuring that everything is uh, remaining under privilege. Next slide. The Coalition Incident Response Team, or CIR, consists of a team of cybersecurity and forensic specialists. And we have a few different types of offerings. The one that folks are most familiar with is incident response, which is after a breach or compromise has occurred. CIR is then retained by counsel to assist with the response efforts. We also offer what we call instant response, which is when you suspect that something nefarious is going on, but can't quite confirm that it's a fully fledged cyber incident. CIR can assist here as an advisory consultant and perform analysis triage. 
Security office hours is another unique offering that we have and we encourage our insurers to take advantage of. So if you're experiencing something minor, something, um, uh, some technical glitch and would like some quick advice or guidance, we can set up a security office call to assess the situation and offer next steps. And finally, the newest offering of ours is the malware signal alerts, which has already seen quite a lot of success in preventing huge losses. And I will talk a little bit more about this on the next slide. Part of what we do at Coalition is monitor attacker infrastructure and domains. And sometimes we receive external indications that we call signals that may indicate that there is an active malware infection within our insurer's networks. So should we positively identify one of these malicious signals, we would then notify our policyholders, advise them on containment and next steps and whether an investigation would be necessary. In this case, we identified a malware signal that showed traffic going to an attacker infrastructure coming from within an insurer's environment. And our signal was granular enough that it was able to identify the exact computer that was the source of the malicious traffic. And the malware in this case was what was known as a Drydex banking trojan, which is often a precursor to ransomware. So to prevent a fully fledged ransomware attack, we wanted to get our hands on this infection as quickly as possible, especially because Drydex is commonly affiliated with ransomware variants that result in ransoms upwards of six figures and are also linked with data theft. So CIR connected with the insured's IT personnel right away, and our immediate next steps were to deploy an advanced endpoint protection solution that allows us to monitor the threat status of the device. You can look at it like an antivirus on steroids that uses behavior-based detection techniques to stop advanced forms of malware like banking trojans, like ransomware, and other types of zero-day. Um, we also collected the computer that was identified in the signal as being the source of the malicious traffic and performed a forensic analysis on that system. We found that the system was indeed compromised by the Stridex banking trojan, and there was also evidence to suggest that a threat actor had manually tunneled into that system and performed reconnaissance and was setting the stage for enterprise-wide deployment. So we literally got it just in time. Our analyst jumped on the examination very quickly and was able to turn the findings around within a day. And then we isolated the system from the network, air gapping it to prevent further spreading. And then once we started monitoring the infrastructure, we actually found the attacker attempting to reinfect the insurance network multiple times using phishing emails um, and trying to reintroduce that banking trojan and that ransomware. But we were able to detect and block these processes. But here's the real twist in the story. About a week later, our threat intelligence team who monitors attacker communications on the dark web received additional intelligence. The attackers had posted messages on their panels revealing our insured's revenue as well as other company information specific to our insured and stating that they were about to flip the switch on the ransomware. So we probably dodged the ransom by literally a strand of hair. We likely got to it either days or hours before it was deployed as the bad guys were already finalizing that demand before flipping the switch. So this was a really close call for us and a huge win. And for the insured, it didn't cost them a dime. Next slide. Great, thanks so much, Shelly. They're incredible insights. And, and having worked for a few insurance companies, I can tell you that um, the amount of data, the information, the intel that we have in-house is literally unmatched by, by anyone else in this industry. It's an incredible differentiator for what we do. So I'm just gonna um, quickly you know, highlight something uh, very important as you all uh, think about working with us. Hopefully this presentation has given you some excellent insights into what makes Coalition so unique as you approach cyber risk with your clients. Uh, we do have a streamlined appointment process. We're happy to chat about that with uh, everyone on the phone today. Um, we've highlighted, you know, our quoting flow and some of the resources that we offer. So we're really excited to continue to expand our footprint across the company and and really bring our solutions to companies, to businesses across Canada and help them manage cyber risk. Um, we have a number of questions that came in during the session. Please feel free to answer, uh, ask any more during uh, the Q&A section. Um, thanks again to all of our panelists for participating and, and offering your insights today. Really appreciate that. So I wanna kick it off, a uh, question for Katie. Are your limits policy aggregate or do they apply for each and every claim? 
Um, so we do have a policy aggregate, but we also give breach response costs outside of the limit of liability. So if the insured's buying a $1 million policy, they're also getting a $1 million for breach response, which would include forensic costs, legal costs, notification costs. So really the total policy limit would actually be $2 million. Thanks, Katie. And something that uh, uh, we hadn't really touched on is all of the services provided by Shelley's team are in-house coalition incident response. Those are actually offered with a $0 retention. So it's um, a huge benefit, not just because of our expertise and our, our speed at responding, but it's actually uh, essentially free services for our policyholder, encouraging them to work directly with us. Um, we had a couple of questions related to our technology how we scan, what we scan, how can we know a policyholder has firewalls? Uh, I'm gonna take this one, um, having been with the company the longest of, of the four on the phone today. So we have an in-house threat intelligence team. We actually purchased a company called Binary Edge at the end of 2019. Um, and we brought over all of their in-house tools and resources to really feed into our underwriting risk management processes. So uh, while we do collect, you know, we aggregate tons of information from the dark web, from the internet, from some data sources. Uh, we truly are a technology company. We've built our own scanning model. We've built our own risk management tools. So when we say that we're scanning to see if a company has a firewall, we have the ability to scan their uh, externally facing network and see if they've set up a firewall to, to protect their systems. Um, we will never try to um, hack that firewall to get inside their systems. It's really just a perimeter scan to see if they've got that set up and that factors into our underwriting. Um, so hopefully that answers the two questions that came in on the technology. A um, few other questions. Uh, sorry, I'm just taking a look here. Uh, we've got two part question coming in from Karen. Do you need to have cyber crime coverage to have to have ransomware covered? Um, Katie, do you want to take that one as well? whether you need to have cybercrime to have ransomware covered? Okay, maybe Katie might be on mute, so I'm gonna go ahead and, and take that one. So the cybercrime coverage that um, we generally refer to as our social engineering, our funds trans transfer fraud, our invoice manipulation coverage, um, those are truly first party uh, coverages, basically protecting the company's um, you know, bank accounts. Ransomware is separate from that. So essentially, you know, the things that Shelly talked about where we're responding is on the forensics piece, where we would pay a ransom is where we deem there to no, you know, no, be no way of really recovering from backups or alternative means. Um, and that, that decision would be made in conjunction with the investigation. And maybe I'll, I'll hand it off to Shelly to, to comment more there, but you do not need to buy crime coverage in order to have ransomware covered. Um, a lot of questions coming in, so I'm just going to try to address uh, a few of them. Um, we had a question about our capacity. Um, Danton, do you want to do you want to touch on capacity? Uh, mentioned that we have 20 million in limits available. Yeah, for sure. So yeah, we can write up to 20 million limits. So we we do have that capacity to write up to 20 million for uh, most insuring agreements, barring any sublimits for, you know, your funds transfer fraud, uh, phishing. Um, but yeah, we can write up to 20 million in limits for uh, our cyber coverage. Danton, I think it's also worth touching yeah. on minimum limits and minimum premiums as well. Yeah, for sure. So while we can offer that higher limit of 20 million, we can go up to that amount. We can also offer as low as 25,000. Um, our minimum premium is $50 and we do see from time to time some premiums roll in you know, 50, 60, $70. So at that 25,000 limit. Um, so we have that $50 minimum premium. And we also have a hundred dollar policy fee that attaches to our, um, to each policy. So the minimum can actually fall under that a hundred dollar policy fee as well. Thanks, Danton. Um, we had a few questions about the presentation. So this this presentation, unfortunately, is not CE accredited, um, but we are working on some uh, accredited presentations. So hopefully we'll have those out in Alberta soon. Uh, also a question of whether or not this would be recorded. Um, we will have a recording sent um, by email as a follow up from our growth team. So uh, you will receive a copy of this. Uh, 
Um, so we had a, a technical question, Shelly, if maybe you want to take this one. So there was a question, can ransomware be a result of phishing? Do you want to maybe touch on that? Oh yes, absolutely. And ransomware is absolutely, um, can be a result of phishing. And it's in fact, one of the most common vectors of entry for ransomware um, based on the claims trends that we're seeing. Um, ransomware usually enters into the environment in one of two ways. It's either through some type of vulnerability that allowed the attacker direct remote access to the network. And then they literally just manually copy over the ransomware executable and run it. Um, and then what's more common these days is indirectly through phishing. Um, so typically what that looks like is somebody in the organization would receive a phishing email um, that has some sort of malicious, malicious attachment. Um, once that gets executed, it would ask the user to run um, a, a script that's embedded within the document. Um, and then that essentially triggers uh, an outbound communication to an attacker server to download a, a backdoor or a foothold. Attackers would then leverage that type of a post exploitation backdoor um, to tunnel into the environment and then deploy ransomware. So it's sort of like multi-step, multi-phasic deployment strategy, but um, in most cases, they are coming in originally through a phishing email. Great question. Thanks, Shelly. Uh, great answer there. We appreciate the technical expertise. Uh, we had a few um, very specific questions, so I'm just going to flip the page um, and provide our contact information. There was a question about coverages question about our application. So um, please reach out. We're happy to answer those questions. We've got a couple minutes left, so we'll answer a couple a couple of other things. Um, one of the important questions that came in is, you know, getting appointed. What does that process look like? Um, Danton, could you touch on that? Yeah, for sure. So as you see on the screen here, um, simple, easy process for an email here. Uh, so you would just email get started at coalitioninc.ca. And from there, you'd be routed to the business development folk that would be responsible for the region. So if you're in the central Canada area, um, you would email that to uh, get started at coalitioninc.ca and it would be routed to myself. Similarly, if you're in the Toronto area, area, if you email this email address, it would be routed to the BDs in that area as well. Um, and from there, we would continue the conversation about getting started um, with coalition and go from there. Thanks, Danton. Um, there is an, uh, a question on industries we don't write. Um, I'm going to hand that off maybe to Katie, if you could just uh, do a quick refresher on those industries that we don't like, and maybe just our, our overall approach to um, industry selection and account selection. Yeah, for sure. So there aren't too many that we don't like at the moment right now. Our, I think we're only declining about 5% of risks that we write. But uh, risks that we wouldn't write would be casinos, data aggregators, payment enablers pay or payment processors, managed service providers, and then currently cannabis, but we're working on a solution for that right now. Hopefully that answers the question. Thanks, Katie. Um... Uh, looks like um, we actually had somebody reach out already um, to try to discuss an appointment and um, they're getting a bounce back. So it may be the case that the .ca website is not yet live. Um, so I'm going to do something quickly here while we're uh, live in real time. One second. There we go. Um, if you want to reach out for an appointment, please reach out to get started at coalitioninc.com. Uh, I think it might have been the .ca uh, ending that that wasn't working. So hopefully this one will work and we're excited to hear from you. Um, just going to touch very quickly on um, a couple of the other questions. So there's a question about crypto mining. Uh, we are actually one of the largest writers of crypto risks in North America. Um, at the, at, at the moment, we are not yet writing CGL though. So we're writing standalone cyber, standalone uh, technology uh, e &O, but not yet CGL. So hopefully that answers that question. So um, Katie, do you wanna to touch on, there's also a question on excess. Sure. Um, so currently we don't write any excess, but that should be launching very, very shortly. 
like within the next week or two. Perfect, thanks. Um, so I think there's you know a few very specific questions. Hopefully we were able to address the majority of the questions again. A recording will be sent. Um, our team will be following up directly with attendees. Um, if you have any questions, if you're interested in getting appointed, please reach out to our team. We're happy to continue the, the discussion. We love to chat with our brokers to understand you know, what your needs are, how you're approaching cyber, how we can help you write more business. Um, this is uh, you know, one of the most prevalent risks today, unfortunately, and really there's no signs of it slowing down. So whether we're in Canada, the US or overseas, cyber risk is real. It is impacting companies. Um, unfortunately, some businesses are going out, going under because they, they haven't got a plan in place. They haven't transferred the risk appropriately. So we're here to support you and your clients. We're excited to start working together um, and hopefully our approach, our service offering all align with um, your risk management solutions that you're offering to your clients. So again, we thank you for your time. We're extremely excited to start working together and please reach out to our team. Um, Again, to chat about an appointment or with any of the follow-up questions that you might have. Um, thanks, Katie, Danson, and Shelley. Really appreciate your insights, uh, and I hope everybody has a great day.